Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Benjamin Penny. I, um, uh, with Matt, have the honour to um, be in charge of their new China seminar series at the moment. Uh, so first of all, let me um, acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the unceded land on which we meet, especially coming up to the referendum. It's important to acknowledge um, their continuing custodianship of the land and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, uh, first, an apology from me. I've managed to double book myself. So after introducing that, I'm going to have to scoot and he will uh, have to field his own questions and answers, which is, I don't know, it's about Maoism. Is that appropriate or not appropriate? I don't know. You can think about that. Um, nonetheless, it's um, wonderful to see you here. And also there are a number of people online, I know, uh, who are watching as well. So Matt Galway is a senior lecturer here at the ANU um, in history, Chinese studies and Southeast Asian history. Um, he comes to us from immediately past University of Melbourne and before that University of British Columbia um, and is, um, suffice to say, it's safe to say, one of the leading lights in studies of Maoism um, in the Western world, at least, and probably also in Asia. Uh, it's a topic that has faded a little bit over the years and is having a bit of a resurgence now, which is great to see. Um, Matt's speciality, as you're probably all aware, is uh, Maoism in Southeast Asia and particularly in Cambodia, um, and is the proud author of a fairly recent monograph, The Emergence of Global Maoism. Um, it's, um, on a personal note, it's a joy to have Matt as a colleague um, and as a fellow traveler, another appropriate word to use in these circumstances. Um, and so I'll now hand over to him to speak to you on a, a new project that I think grew out of the monograph, the cult on cultural revolution in Cambodia, communist spies, overseas Chinese, and radical urban culture during Phnom Penh's global 60s. I'm sure you'll find it very, very interesting. I'm sure I will too, if I was able to say. And it's, I'm sorry about that. But um, I'll hand over now to Matt and let you have a, a fascinating and stimulating afternoon. Great, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much, everybody, for braving, uh, braving the weather. I know it's been a bit hit or miss. Uh, it definitely was what yesterday. Uh, so thank you, everyone in attendance and everyone joining us online. And my thanks to Ben for the kind introduction and to the uh, CIW for the opportunity to present um, my third monograph uh, project. Uh, this one uh, is my second solo authored one. And I'm hoping that uh, what I present on today uh, will turn into something uh, that is exciting and, and really kind of fills the next end gaps in scholarship. So just a little bit about my previous work, as Ben mentioned, you're absolutely right. Uh, this topic, looking at overseas, overseas Chinese communities in Cambodia, specifically during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and then kind of the emergence of cultural revolution uh, activism, cultural, cultural revolution uh, demonstrations, uh, the emerging in China's first and arguably still remaining client state in Cambodia is something that I've touched upon in my previous works, mainly my first book, and then in the edited volume, which I did with my colleague, Mark Opper, then at uh, Randolph Megan University in Virginia. And I've also explored uh, the history of overseas CCP intelligence operations during this time, just with one particular uh, case study of Vita Zhou, who I'll talk about a little bit today, with uh, the Made in China Journal, as well as looking at uh, Pong Che, the personal secretary of Pol Pot during the 1960s and early 70s. Uh, somebody who himself was a, a very important activist intellectual in Trump and radical 60s, and he himself, though never studying in Paris, which was the crucible of a lot of Maoism in the CPK, uh, Khmer Rouge, we, we call them Khmer Rouge, but the Communist Party of Cambodia, CPK, uh, kind of uh, intellectual thrust. Uh, he was nonetheless really important on the ground and somebody who was uh, commanded a great uh, following among intellectuals and in cities. And I've also looked at Maoism elsewhere. I, I recently uh, published a piece with my colleague, uh, Lynn Holmstrand of NUS, on um, Maoism as one of the many ideas that the PKI, the Communist Party of Indonesia, was engaging with in the 50s and 60s before the uh, horrible um, genocide of, of them in 1965 and onward. So 
Uh, just, I'm just skipping through some of these things here. I'll just present an, uh, an outline of how the book is taking shape right now. Again, it is a work in progress. So I'm hoping to receive some good comments and some questions and some feedbacks to provoke ways in which this project can materialize in a more kind of concrete whole. So I'll just look at the, the state of the field in terms of extant scholarship, presenting some aims and some sources that I've uh, engaged with in my several trips to Cambodia uh, and a few trips to China back when we could go and do archival research in the mainland. Then dig into two particular communist spies I'm really interested in. I mentioned Viva Zhou, another one is Guang Ximing. These are two figures who've written personal memoirs about their life in the field. And I think that they're important, although obviously uh, problematic. Uh, so it's important to kind of juxtapose them against other sources, however we can. Then I'm going to dig into radical newspapers and cultural revolution enthusiasm in Pompeii. Specifically, two main newspapers, um, Nianhua Rival, or Sino Khmer Daily, or Khmer Chinese Daily, and then Meijang Rival, or Mekong Daily. So what the first of these was the official propaganda outlet of the PRC embassy of Phnom Penh during that time and was kind of mission command for a lot of the CCP's um, ideological work in the city, so to speak. Then I'm going to switch over to the ethnic Chinese revolutionary movement and how it kind of bridged what was going on in the capital with the countryside and connected a lot of these intellectuals who uh, may, had never ever been to China or didn't read Chinese to a very Chinese motivated um, kind of uh, space and atmosphere, so to speak. So just on the extant scholarship, uh, there's not a whole lot on what the CCP was doing in terms of intelligence activities there. Uh, there's it, it's seemingly a huge gap that has been left, been left unaddressed by scholars, especially considering this was the first ever client state for China, uh, certainly from 1975 onward. We do have some uh, scholars who have dug into the diplomatic relations and military and tech exchanges, particularly the former uh, Chilean ambassador and Prince Seanok, the one time head of state of Cambodia's personal biographer, Julio Hildres, who was at Mount Monash, and Andy Bertha, who's now at Johns Hopkins. These, they've kind of tried to track, you know, individual figures, whether it's leading figures going from China to Cambodia or military and technological advisors going to advise uh, and provide advice and, and steward in some senses uh, kind of the advancements there for the Khmer Rouge during the 70s. But there remains no real book-length study on what the intelligence operations were, and there hasn't been a book-length study on the Chinese in Cambodia and Cambodian Chinese since Bill Wilmot's The Chinese of Cambodia in 1967 and the political structure of the Chinese community in Cambodia, which came out in 71. So we're five plus decades since anyone's written a book-length analysis, certainly in Anglophone scholarship, on the overseas Chinese communities there and the importance of overseas Chinese communities to the radical foment that was there, but also just more generally. Uh, so my hope is to kind of fill that extent gap by come, kind of bridging these two things together, right? Looking at, for instance, overseas CCP intelligence work, kind of drawing from George Guo's 2012 book, which I have uh, pictured here, um, China's Security State, and trying to kind of move from the kind of pop readership of the Roger Falagos of the world and kind of just really look at what is actually going on on the ground during that time. What were agents seeing? What were they doing? What can we corroborate to the best of our knowledge of the documents that we're allowed to look at? It's a very hard task in, in recent times. While also, again, updating the scholarship on overseas Chinese in Cambodia, as we've done quite a bit of time since anyone's done that. Anymore. So one of the questions I'm trying to ask is how did the Diao Chao the Central Investigation Department, the KGB, but for the CCP, which then in Cambodia operated out of the People's Republic of China Embassy in Phnom Penh. So it's foreign branch, it had a foreign branch there in the embassy. How did it foment Maoist zeal first among overseas Chinese communities during the Cultural Revolution and China enthusiasts in Cambodia, those either through readers or through you know, connecting them with figures who might be uh, interested in, in turning them into the high kind of Maoism of the day. One thing that I've argued, and this is again still a work in progress, is that the Central Investigation Department approached this with a three-pronged strategy of local recruitment, community outreach, and cultural revolution-style agitprop via popular Chinese language newspapers. And I've mentioned Sada Khmer Daily, Mianhua Rival, and Meijang Rival. And these two pieces, or these two outlets in particular, spurred Maoist ardor among ethnic Chinese. Um, not all, obviously, this isn't the monolith. We have various diverse communities, some Kuomintang loyalists, some apolitical and some very fervently in support of Mao. 
but that this then extended this kind of enthusiasm then extended to China curious Cambodian intellectuals. And I use China curious because I'm not quite at the stage where I want to say folks who are reading Mao stuff and interested in what's going on in China, they hadn't quite made that jump to becoming full-fledged Maoist guerrillas. That really comes quite late uh, in the 60s. But nevertheless, enthused by these radical materials and this emergent radical urban culture in the 60s, many overseas Chinese and Khmer progressive activists intellectuals at Chaya and Fu Yun and Fu Nim, these popular ministers in the National Assembly at the time, will flock to join this revolutionary movement and or the Communist Party of Kampuche itself. So the ethnic Chinese revolutionary movement, I'll get into a little bit towards the end of the talk. So just a brief note on sources. Uh, I've conducted a lot of research on these newspapers uh, across the last 10 years, uh, beginning first, of course, at the National Archives of Cambodia and Phnom Penh, uh, with a little bit of work at the Documentation Center of Cambodia. They don't have a great collection of Chinese language newspapers. I was just recently there last December and January to try and connect the NIC collections with the Queen Mother Library collections now uh, where the DC Cabinet is hosted or is housed. Uh, and, and of course, doing work at the uh, Shaman University Southeast Asian Studies Center, which is um, uh, at Shaman University. They had the biggest collection I could find of original copies of the Myanmar uh, Rabao or San Bernard Daily, which was, again, the principal propaganda outlet for the PRC Embassy in Cambodia during that time. There's also these agents' memoirs themselves, which, uh, again, have to be dealt with with a great degree of scrutiny, because a lot of what they said is kind of mixes nostalgia, fact and fiction, and what have you, but they are nevertheless interesting sources with which to engage. Avita Joe wrote my story with the Communist Parties of China and Kampuchea, a record of the rise and fall of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, which is his kind of life and times and his experience working as one of the head editors and translators for uh, the um, Santa Khmer Daily. And then Huang Ximing, who went by his uh, nom de plume, uh, Thie Gua, waves through the Mekong River, a faithful record of the Khmer Rouge. And this piece is more about a fictionalized version of himself, but does de detail things that he saw and witnessed and experienced as an agent in the field, someone who was charged as kind of this charge d'affaire of connecting a link between Vietnam and Cambodia before those relations went sour. So just some uh, images of, of these newspapers, uh, most recently from my time in the National Archives, just back in December, and then the co cover of the book, Mejang Rebao, or sorry, uh, Mejang Meho, uh, Juma Meho, sorry, uh, which is the two volume, like 900 plus page um, memoir of sorts, in which Huang Ximing's protagonist kind of navigates the waves of the foreign intelligence work while working in mainland Southeast Asia. There's also some other uh, materials that I've been digging into as of late, uh, particularly um, with the uh, Australians, so I recently gave a talk uh, at a conference, uh, History Australia conference hosted by Sophie Lynn Wilson and Andrew Levitas at the University of Sydney. And I recognized that by about midway through day two that I was gonna be the only presenter there who had nothing to say about Australia. And it was a History Australia conference. So I decided why not go and trawl through all of my documents that I obtained from the Queen Mother Library. And there are several tens of thousands and see if there's anything really cool that I can bring into from what China watchers uh, from Australia or from Australia based in Cambodia and China, what they were saying and what they were writing. And it turns out that Noel Deschamps, who was um, himself uh, stationed in the Department of uh, External Affairs, um, was actually an avid watcher of the Chinese minority in Cambodia and had authored many memorandums uh, with lengthy descriptions of the origins and cultural linguistic topographies of the Chinese communities in Penh saying which groups lived, were originally from, say, Fujian or this area in, in, uh, in Guangzhou and, and, and why they migrated and, and just kind of laying this out. It's very detailed. There are percentages. There are mentions of cultural events. It's really quite fascinating that these lengthy kind of memorandums existed. And many of these are, of course, in courtesy of the Australian embassy of Montana and date as far back as the early 1960s. Also got a fair bit of Department of Foreign Affairs inward cablegrams, uh, many of which were once confidential. Uh, and, and these will include, for instance, uh, cablegrams from the Australian Embassy in Beijing, See, Stephen Fitzgerald writing about his anxieties about Prince Sihanouk. There's a lot of fear among the United States, uh, Canada, uh, Australia, about whether Sihanouk had gone too far to the left and whether his kind of interest in China was going to lead to another kind of uh, the spilling over the Vietnam conflict into Cambodia in a very bad way for them. And also some anxieties about the prominence of some leftist ministers 
uh, who had uh, immense following, people who would end up becoming ministers within the Communist Party of Kamchat. So a lot of these documents, of course, are preoccupied with the fears about the head of state standing uh, and the fear of Cambodia turning Maoist, so to speak. Those are taken directly from the quotes uh, from, from one, of these, uh, one of these memos. And they just kind of, again, highlight that there's a lot of interest in what's going on with Chinese communities in Cambodia at this time. Uh, and the focus for me in this book will be largely in, in the urban centers. Uh, we do have rural uh, Patiao communities, overseas Chinese communities, but largely we're talking uh, for the cases of, of this book because it's one that I hope will get the ball rolling on more work. Uh, the focus will be on Phnom Penh. There's enough there to really go on for uh, a monograph at this stage. My hope is to expand that to, to maybe about them uh, and um, other other things I've seen later, later on. So a little bit about uh, one of the characters I'll be talking about today is Peter Joe. Uh, I'm not the first person to write about him, but I certainly find him very fascinating. I wrote a piece for the Made in China Journal about his reflections on his time as a Chinese intelligence officer, somebody who had spent time in the field, somebody who was, for instance, uh, had earned the trust from his superiors to to go in and and and. Uh, you know, as a Cambodia hand to borrow from uh, his his quote of Wang Shuren, one of his superiors, uh, in his time as like a valuable asset for the PRC embassy to kind of deeply embed himself in, in Chinese communities in Batambang and Phnom Penh, find out who's going for what, who's, for instance, what ideological leanings they have, uh, and to uncover uh, potential plots that might happen should, say, maybe a, a certain figure from the CCP was visiting Cambodia as part of an official state visit, what if there's a plot to take him out? Uh, you know, things like that. So he himself was born in Batambang, uh, which is in northwestern Cambodia, not far from the Thai border. And he joins uh, Maoist reading groups via these athletic clubs in Batambang and eventually will relocate to the capital. He works as a Chinese language journalist in the 50s for Bien Hoa Rival. And then he'll eventually ascend to become the vice manager of the newspaper itself. During this time, he's quoted uh, by Wang. Uh, by, by Chen Wen Yi, who's written about him before, as having been a member of the ethnic Chinese re revolutionary movement. Uh, that's hard to co corroborate without archival sources, so I'm kind of putting an asterisk next to that until I can say 100% with certitude that he was actually involved in that revolutionary movement, uh, which was actually like mounting. So it will, of course, uh, this newspaper is important because again, it was the official propaganda outlet of the embassy. And it was operated uh, by the CCP-backed Batambang Overseas Chinese Party Organization, one of many party organizations in Southeast Asia, but this was a prominent one in Cambodia. And it's during this time where he kind of falls in with the crowd and he's in these athletic clubs, he's starting to learn Chinese, he's really interested in upping his language skill, and people are making recommendations for him to read radical literature. And he finds himself very kind of taken by this. And he's advised by superiors to even kind of consider making the pivot from working as a journalist to moving over and working as an intelligence agent, using his journalist ties, using his deep embeddedness in the communities as an opportunity to kind of drum up what's going on at the local level, where people stand, whether they're real loyalists or whether they might just uh, might be keen on restoring the Guomindang and making a big statement by having a visiting state leader uh, assassinated, for instance. He, uh, uh, according to his own uh, storytelling, and this is this is again, it's, it's one of those things where we'll uh, hopefully one day have access to archives to be able to corroborate. He was almost singularly responsible for uncovering a plot in 1963 to assassinate Il Chao Chi and his wife when both were visit on an official state visit on the invite of then ruling Prince Seonuk, uh, and that this was a Guomindang plot that the GMD had. had been working kind of within these communities to recruit agents and plan an assassination of Liu Xiaoqi and his wife when they were visiting. That this would be kind of a big statement. And, and Vida Zhou recounts that he was responsible for kind of turning over, turning over the leaves and, and, and rough, rough, rattling the cages, so to speak, to find out this information and, and then bring those who were responsible to justice. But this kind of loyalty to the CCP does not last forever. After the Khmer Rouge, the CPK takes over in 1975. The CCP will start to kind of leave agents in the field to fend themselves, spend for themselves, and now will die a year after the CPK takeover in 76. 
agents like the Dajil were kind of left to try and connect with other people who were there. They were either restricted to the cities or they could only communicate with their uh, brethren in the field. So he kind of was in this liminal space and he was very, very concerned about what was going to happen next. Was he to go and join the guerrillas in, in the countryside and, 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 and build the high Maoism that the Khmer Rouge was envisioning or was he to stay in the cities and wait to be recalled to Beijing? Eventually he will return there. And when he does, he admonishes them for abandoning him and his comrades uh, during the, the worst excesses of the CPK uh, regime. Now, he's not aware of the extent of the genocide at this time, but he, according to his memoirs, he was aware of, through, through the grapevine of certain um, ethnic Chinese motivated killings, as in that the CPK was targeting overseas Chinese and ethnic Chinese members, specifically based on that, uh, their ethnicity for, for execution, and that he felt that he was kind of left high and dry. And then he says he wants to quit the party and he endures a really, really rough treatment. Uh, he spent some time working in a factory in Hong Kong before he eventually uh, flees to South Carolina in the 80s, where he works as a custodian in Greenville and becomes very, very fond of the United States. So this kind of story, which is, you know, again, I've got a cover of the book cover there. Uh, it's just one of, of a few that I've encountered. Uh, Wang Ximing was another uh, who the Del Chabu had tasked with establishing uh, underground connections between the CPK uh, and Vietnam, simply because, again, he was aware that you know, they didn't quite like each other very much, despite sharing a lot of similar values and ideas. Huang's uh, memoirs in great detail uh, explain and describe the mass evacuations of the cities, particularly with Phnom Penh, as he was there. Uh, I've, I've, part, I've translated parts of, of, of uh, his reflections of Phnom Penh in a nostalgic way, right, that it's a city with brilliant neon lights and art deco and, and, and Beaux-Arts influence architecture, but that it was now a shell of itself and in fact a ghost town because the party upon taking over on 17 April 1975 had forced everyone out of the cities in an evacuation uh, to force them to go work in the countryside. And only the only ones who remained were party members, prisoners, uh, and of course, uh, foreign representatives like the you know, like Peter Joe and, and Wang Shiming. He himself was Cambodian born, so like Peter Joe was locally recruited. He studied in Saigon for a bit before eventually going to China. He had spent some time in between there. So his return in 1950 was kind of, again, just like more than a visit. And he goes to support the CCP. And he falls in with the secret front organizations there and eventually earns a post as an intelligence agent, whereby one of his tasks was to spy on Vietnam and then to open a common line of communication between Cambodia and Vietnam to ensure what's going on and to kind of track that for CCP interest. So my hope is to go through this in great detail because it's, again, it's two volumes and uh, I've just kind of done the brass tacks on this uh, because it's a lot of translation work. But the key points that I'm trying to get out of this is even though it's a mem, like it's a, it's, it has a lot of fictional content, right? It's, it's, it's not actually um, Wang Ximing himself as the protagonist, but Chang Xiu Wen. Um, and that Chang himself happens to also be a covert agent with a public identity uh, as a small businessman, much like uh, Wang Ximing himself. There's a lot of kind of fact that you can extract from this stuff here. And a lot of really kind of uh, vivid detail about the way that the CPK operated during its early years of rule. So just a little bit about how the enthusiasm of the Cultural Revolution kind of spurs among these overseas Chinese. So we've got a couple of agents, one of whom was very kind of intimately tied to this enthusiasm. One of the things about over the overseas Chinese newspapers is that there were several of these newspapers in China or in Cambodia at the time. Uh, there were dozens of newspapers in Cambodia, uh, many of which, of course, you had your in my language newspapers, you had your French language newspapers, but there were several Chinese language newspapers. And Sino Khmer Daily, as well as Gongshan Rebao, the Industry and Commerce Daily, were the two main ones with the largest readership. And Sino Khmer Daily, in particular, had 6,000 issues in circulation nationwide by the 1960s. And the editors of this newspaper knew that a lot of overseas Chinese in Cambodia had originated from Guangdong province. And many of these issues would play to kind of that nostalgia for the homeland, right? So you'd often have people uh, dedicating, you know, drawing from poetry from the region or or they, they report on, on, a, on a cultural display like dance or, or an opera or something like that. Per Wilmot, three out of every four Chinese in Cambodia are Jojo. 
And in the cities, there are less than 70% that make up most of the nine out of 10 of the rural population. So there's this kind of, again, recognition of the demography uh, of, of how many, you know, where people are from there. And that a lot of these emigrants had emerged from particular parts in Guangzhou, particularly the Shan of Zheyang, Chaoyang, and Hunin. And by 61, 1961, 135,000 uh, overseas Chinese were actually in the city. And this is a city of about two and a half million at the time. And there's figure that is that nearly half a million overseas Chinese by 1967 were in Cambodia, which really will throw into sharp relief how massive that evacuation was and how many had to flee after the takeover. So here I just have an image of Joe and Lai and Sihanouka as buddy buddy. Uh, so Joe and Lai is just here on the right, Sihanouka's in the middle. Sihanouka is the head of state of Cambodia from its independence in 1953 all the way up to uh, until its overthrow in 1970. And Joe and Lai and Sihanouk formed a really close friendship. Uh, Julio Helpers, the aforementioned personal biographer of Sihanouk, had written extensively about how close they were. Uh, though Sihanouk refused to be a communist, refused to accept those ideas, uh, he himself was very interested in Joe and Lai and Mao, and he met with them on several occasions. Sihanouk visited China many times in his life. Here he is uh, on a delegation, one of his delegation visits to China. Joe and Lai, of course, is there. And it's, Again, it's this, this warm reception of Sihanouk. This had uh, two purposes, domestic and international. The domestic purpose was to show that, hey, look, we can even be friends with a reactionary prince. Uh, he's non-communist, but we can get along. Look how committed to world peace we are, rather than, say, the Soviets, who are socialist imperialists at this time. Uh, and then for international purposes, of course, it showed that China was committed to the five principles of peaceful coexistence, which meant that it could, again, um, befriend these national leaders, regardless of their ideological stance. But it wasn't just people like Zhou Enlai and Liu Shaqi who were figures visiting China, Cambodia at this time. Uh, Deputy Mayor Wang Kunlun, for instance, uh, led the Guangdong Chaozhou Opera uh, troupe to, to perform uh, the drama Meeting Among the Reeds in Phnom Penh in the winter of 1960, after which he himself published a lengthy poem in Sana Khmer Daily. And as Vita Zhou recounts in his memoir, uh, this literary style gave face to the newspaper and won over many of many readers. And it was already a popular newspaper at this time, as Wilmot acknowledges in 67, that it was one of the most important uh, newspapers at the time, carrying local and international financial and commercial news. But by the 1960s, its tenor of, of kind of sharing, uh, shedding light on the friendly fraternal relations between China and Cambodia, uh, had shifted to a more radical kind of Red Guard enthusiasm. And the newspaper really turns into a very heavy propaganda outlet to reflect that uh, changing shift. And you see a lot of these parallels, a lot of these parallels between Chinese newspapers in, in Maoist China, like um, Renmin Rebaal and Manpa Rebaal. So I just have some images of Sinok and Zhou Enlai on, a, uh, on their tour of Akhmer Bad, which is the very, very famous Hindu then Buddhist temple in Cambodia, it's kind of one thing we had to do. And then this, just an issue of Myanmar Rebaal kind of showing the radical shift, right? So this is an issue from the mid sixties, you know, Mao Zedong Sisyang Wan Sui, like long live Mao Zedong God, right? It's that shift of right there on 1966, right, you know, right in the maelstrom of the cultural revolution, Mao-centric iconoclasm. And you have first page of Myanmar Rebaal saying, in Cambodia, long live Mao Zedong God. So naturally seeing that would not like this. And issues will also show like the, the uh, humiliation of figures, the wearing of dunce caps, the big character posters. So this was their first exposure for many overseas Chinese communities uh, to, to what was going on in China and just the kind of the, the, the frenzy of, of Mao Zedong at the time. I apologize that the quality of the images aren't so great. Uh, the archives, uh, the, the newspapers are in quite a bit of disrepair uh, and uh, the quality of my phone's not so good. But this is as good as I can get. Um, but my hope is to again uh, to go there with a, with a, uh, possibly an agreement with the Queen Mother Library, the National Archives of Tech, to go there with the team and scan the entire thing for public use instead of having to you know get researchers go in and pay one dollar for one phone picture, which adds up over time. Trust me. Mm -hmm. So the enthusiasm spreads not just in the pages but also into the actions of many of these overseas Chinese. Uh, there are demonstrations by overseas Chinese organizations outside the Soviet embassy and elsewhere, particularly in Phnom Penh. Mao, Mao badges are omnipresent in the city. Uh, 
Cambodian military men even collect them. Uh, Chinese language newspapers uh, will even publish cultural revolution propaganda, calling on readers to emulate Lei Feng and to read more of Mao's stuff. And this will spread, of course, very closely to others uh, who will see these demonstrations against imperialism among these groups and take an interest in why. And this will lead people like Che and others to take an interest in, for instance, reading Mao's works themselves in French uh, at the time. And this local Chinese support for the parallel campaign that's going on in China, so the, the Cultural Revolution and from there, will lead to support for the then rural-based Khmer Rouge movement, CPK movement, and kind of say, well, look at this, like this movement is, is coming to replace uh, Sihanouk and then replace Lan Nol, who was the, the American uh, US-backed uh, leader, military right-wing strongman who replaced Sihanouk in 1970 with In a Bloodless Coup. And, and in this show of, of, of anti-imperialist resistance, these communities really wanted to lend their weight and support behind this Khmer Rouge movement and to restore Sihanouk if they could, seeing him as the, le the lesser of those two evils. And it's during this time that people like Vita Zhou will meet regularly with figures who are involved in the Khmer Rouge. Uh, particularly, Vita Zhou recalls that he met with Kael Mayos, who had in fact traveled personally with Pol Pot to China. Uh, he couldn't make it to China in the, in the long run, but uh, he made it as far as Hanoi, but he was his kind of travel buddy in 1965-66. Uh, he gets a stomach illness and he can't continue. Paul Pot then goes and meets with uh, Mao and Joe and Lai and everyone and, and says, okay, from now on, I'm, I'm going to be a Maoist. And Kyo Maos was also the head of the popular Chechong group, which was the legal front organization for the CPK. And he was also a newspaper man himself. So this really kind of, again, the two men of the same trade. Sihanouk will get very suspicious in the 60s of a lot of this going on, and he will shutter all of the leftist newspapers, uh, all of the Chinese language newspapers, as a response to their popularity, and they'll even personally uh, admonish Zhou Enlai for encouraging on his visit in the 60s uh, for Chinese to show their enthusiasm for Chairman Mao and say, you're really interfering with uh, maintaining neutrality in my country. Why are you doing this? We've been such good buds. What's going on? So this radicalism will extend outside of these overseas Chinese communities and will spread to progressives, activists, students, and Buddhist monks even, as David Chandler's work has shown. And many of these eight experts will even from, from China or in Cambodia as part of that continued fraternal relations will, according uh, to, to David Chandler, will waive freely available copies of Mao's Little Red Book, which as he says, and I quote, abounded among high school students and younger Buddhist monks. Khmer youth will wear Mao badges. And students will emulate the Red Guards by posting large wall posters and criticize the Sihanouk government. Local Chinese schools will even instruct Mao Zedong thought in high school. Government will threaten to close these, and in many cases, we'll just end up closing, closing a lot of these Chinese language schools. And here I have an, uh, an image. It's again not the world's greatest. Uh, again, that's the quality. I'm trying to do my best with what I got. But the image is again a mass demonstration on the 11th of March in 1965 in Pump and against US imperialism. And it's almost exclusively students and overseas Chinese all in the city, waving flags and destroying kind of property and kind of demonstrating against what they see as the presence of U.S. imperialism in mainland Southeast Asia. But that's from an issue of the Khmer Chinese Friendship Association, which was an overtly Maoist uh, reading group in which many of the future Khmer, Khmer leaders held ministerial posts. Now, I'll start with the image here. This I got from my research just at the National Archives. This is to my knowledge, the only picture of Hunim from his trip to Beijing in 1965. Now, Hunim was the Minister of Information to the Khmer Rouge, but in 1965-66, he was one of the main leadership, leading figures of the Khmer, China, Khmer Chinese Friendship Association, and he was also a, cap, uh, a cabinet minister of Sinhala at the time, so an elected official in the Cambodian government, and he had certainly written a lot about his interest in China. He wrote a lengthy political economy doctoral dissertation, which I've written about extensively in the book and then in, even further in the uh, chapter in that edited volume I showed earlier. But here I just, I couldn't, I could barely recognize him because he actually looks healthy. All the pictures I see of Hunim are from the countryside when he's fighting the guerrilla fight and he's a lot more um, svelte to, to, say, to say one word or another. 
But the, he was one of these figures who actually goes to China and liaises with main, main leaders. He returns, and thinking review wrote uh, kind of an excerpt from his speech saying the East wind will triumph over the West wind and Chairman Mao's thought has world significance. So this is just, just an aside about this image, just because it was so such a such a fun find to get. Um, and as far as I know, it's the only one of him from that trip and the only one of any of the delegates who went to Beijing during that time in existence, courtesy of, of Nikon Daily, Beijing Rebellion. So just a little bit back to uh, Vita Zhou, his close ties to overseas Chinese communities, because again, he deeply embedded himself in there as a journalist and as one of these head editors of the uh, Nihon Rebellion. This kind of these close ties connected him directly with the ethnic Chinese revolutionary movement, which at the time was a loosely formed organization operated by the CCP's overseas branch. And under the Chinese embassy's directive, uh, as uh, Wang Chani has, has uh, contended in his work, uh, Vida Cho's links to the movement may have saved the lives of National Assemblymen, Hunim included, when he was back in Cambodia. As he tells the story that Sianuk had planned to arrest and detain, to detain all three of these men, Hu Yun, Kisampan, and Hunim, all of whom will become ministers in Democratic Kampuchea from 75 onward, because of their leftist ties, because they were very popular ministers, they were radically minded, they were very popular among peasants, they ran on peasant-friendly programs and sweeping social reform in the countryside. And that he had kind of been almost singularly responsible for kind of getting them out of harm's way. And this was important too, because by 1967, CNUX policies had spurred peasant unrest in the uh, Samlok district, uh, sub-district of Batamang province. And Sihanouk, in fact, accused these very same ministers of instigating this rebellion, calling on their constituents to rise up and form peasant organizations, not like Mao observed in his 1927 report. And Sihanouk even berated these guys for ginning up peasant unrest and threatened their lives for the role that he alleged they played in the Samlok uprising. So naturally, Vida chose now getting involved with leading Khmer Rouge figures uh, in, in such a way as to kind of, again, safeguard them from, from harm. Now, just lastly, on the ethnic Chinese revolutionary movement, with uh, which he had great ties, uh, we have, of course, uh, the leader at the time, per uh, Wang Chinese work, and per the, the work of Jean-Pierre Lai, who's written a little bit about this himself uh, in French and in Chinese. Uh, the Hua Yun, or the Ethnic Chinese Revolutionary Movement's leader, is Wu Qingxi, uh, worn by the alias Guoming, who was himself stationed by the CCP in South Vietnam, but he'll relocate to Cambodia in 1950. Another senior leader of this movement, Pan Bing, operates as the editor-in-chief of Meho Regal before Cho succeeds him in the um, newspaper ranks. And they both provide supporting accounts to state that the PRC embassy had direct oversight over these intelligence operations. And that the CCP will even recall figures back to Beijing, and this will shift bodies around and order that this particular movement, in this case, the Huayun in Cambodia, should be developed in an inconspicuous manner and not be publicized to try to let Sino hold power to assist the anti-American struggle in South Vietnam. So you see a little bit of kind of uh, chess going on with the CCP and how it wants to position people in its would-be client state, which, yeah, said so about Hungary. And then the CCP will transfer all members of the Huayun to the CPK in 72, and saying, all right, you're now following these guys, you're now connected directly to the Cambodian communist movement. And they will, in fact, consciously ignore the ethnic Chinese in Cambodia uh, during the worst excesses of the genocide there, so as to kind of, again, maintain their their client state, their friendly fraternal relations with Pol Pot and others, and because they have a very Moscow-friendly Hanoi right next door. And the reason why is Per Wang Tsai is ideological affinity at the time between Mao's CCP and Pol Pot CCP. These are just some images courtesy of the Documentation Center of Cambodia with some of the big figures uh, who are involved in, um, you know, kind of the, the right after the DK, the CPK takeover, like for instance, Who's the PRC ambassador at Sumha, uh, who's the PRC foreign minister at the time, Hui Alban, things like that. So on their visits to Cambodia. And these images are all available for free on the Documentation Center of Archives, uh, Documentation Center of Cambodian um, Archives online. And I'm very grateful for them. 
So just some concluding remarks on a, on a book that is, again, still a work in progress. So there are some loose ends and some things that need work. So I look forward to the Q&A. But what I've kind of come, uh, come to with the reading thus far is the CCP, the PRC Embassy, the Central Investigation Department, and the Ethnic Chinese Revolution Movement all played instrumental roles in spurring rural urban, uh, sorry, urban radical culture that connected overseas Chinese and the Sea of Yaltabu agents to intellectuals, politicians, and the CPP. Right. These are all moving parts, all threads that are connecting into a whole. And that, of course, we saw with these two cases of Huang Ximing and Zhou Gao, uh, and Li Dachou, that the uh, CID, the Central Investigation Department, recruited locally, as both were Cambodian born, and detailed the ways in which they were recruited. Chinese language newspapers with popular readerships were hardly insignificant factors in spurring cultural revolution enthusiasm, particularly in 65 and 66. Which is, you know, just a few, just a few months, even even before the Sunlight Rebellion emerges, uh, blows up in the countryside in Banabang. And the agents played active roles in promoting PRC interests in Cambodia, and intelligence work undercover uh, entailed uncovering plots and reporting suspected enemy activities. Agents like Peter Chill, for instance, did not have close ties or direct access to the CPK after '75 because of the CCP's strategic kind of shift away from the movement, and to say that everybody has to go work with you. Party. So that's when that's where there's a little bit of a dark era. Many of those documents of 75 to 79 may, may have been destroyed uh, or, or simply may have been recovered by you know, Vietnam and their counter invasion in 79. So the hope is that if I extend the project into that era, that maybe uh, there will be some documents for us. So uh, just a couple of links there, but thank you, everyone. I've actually gone under time, so this is great. So I look forward to your questions and comments. <laughs>